let's do some practice with different types of loops and just see how we can use while loops in different ways, do while loops, and for loops. So first off, let's say we have a variable called counter and we're starting it at 100. We could do something like if the counter is greater than zero, display what counter is, and maybe subtract one from the counter. And at the end of the program, we'll say counter ended at whatever its value is. So we'll run this, but since it's an if statement, it starts at 100 and it only executes at once. It's greater than zero, it displays the value, it subtracts one, and it ends at 99. If we actually wanted this to be a countdown, we would need to change this if statement to a while loop. So if statements and while loops look very similar. They both have a condition. That's what, what is between the parentheses are called. So while the counter is greater than zero, do this line of code, then this line of code. Once it hits the closing curly brace, it'll come back up here, test it again. 99 is still greater than zero, so it'll keep going through. Come back up, 98 is greater than zero, so it'll continue on and on. So we can see it starting up here at 100, and then it counts down by one every time and ends at zero. So at this point, it's zero, but when it's zero up here, when it goes back to check that while loop, it will say, no, this is not true, and exit that. So just to make that a little bit clearer, I'm going to say this is going to say end. We'll run this. The loop, it'll say counter is one. Subtract one from the counter, so it becomes zero. It gets here, comes back up here, and checks, is zero greater than zero? No, that's false. So because it's false, it skips over this while loop block. This is only for when it's true. And then it continues on with the rest of the program. Now, if this is greater than or equal to zero, zero is greater than or equal to zero, but zero is not greater than zero. So it, it's false and it doesn't continue with that loop. We could also count down by two or divide by two each time or add up by one and so on. However, we could do equals counter minus two and then it will count down by two each time. We could do counter equals counter divided by two, then it will divide by two each time. But if we did something like counter equals counter plus two, this loop is never going to end because we're starting at 100 and going up. So it'll be 100, 102, 104. So this will continue going on forever. And you can see that here. It's just going to keep running until it hits the maximum integer value. So that's another thing that we need to keep in mind when working with while loops. Something inside of the while loop, inside of this code block, needs to eventually either one, set this condition to false, so either counter needs to eventually hit zero in this case, or something below zero, or two, you need a break statement. So we could have this, this would be fine, we would just need to say something like if counter ends up equaling 200 maybe, then we're going to break, stop looping. So we can run it this way, and it will go from 100 to 200. But logically, this loop doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you check if the counter is greater than zero and then keep going up and then stop once it's at 200? It's just kind of an example of how these work. Otherwise, we could say if we're starting at 100 and going up, we could say if the counter is greater than 200, then break. Uh, oh, sorry while the counter is less than 200, then continue looping. So then we get that again. So we can use the while loop to make a counter. That's one way to do it. When we get to do some for loops in a little bit, those tend to be better for any sort of count up, count down sort of pieces of code. So I'll show you ways that I like to use while loops in so I'll show you some other ways that I like to use while loops. So let's say that we have some input we need from the user. We're going to ask the user, enter a number between 
mm, let's say one and ten. And we'll have them enter that input. Well, let's say we're going to do something if it's one or two or three, but if they enter a negative two or a twenty, what should the program do? Ideally, it should give the user some feedback and then make them re-enter their option. Uh, we don't want to proceed with invalid input, so we could say while input is invalid, so what would be invalid cases? Well, we do want it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. If it's less than 1, then that's invalid. So for instance, we can just kind of start building it this way. We'll have them enter the number again. So this would work for checking negative values. But it's not going to check for if I enter something very big. So what's another invalid statement? Well, hmm, 10 is the last valid value. So we want to see if it's greater than 10, then that's invalid. So invalid input if input is less than 1, or if input is greater than 10. In these cases, they've gone outside the bounds of what's OK. And once I enter something valid, it will continue on with the program execution. A good thing to do here would be to actually define your minimum and maximum as variables. So we could define up here int min is 1, int max, let's just say 5 this time. So over at this point, we can say between min and max. Then down here, we need to see is the input less than the minimum or is the input greater than the maximum? And then we can output this again. So we can then adjust it anywhere in the program. Maybe we have a menu with five options here, but then over there we have a menu with 10 options and so on. So I can try four, that's fine. I can try 10, negative 42, zero, and so on, and those don't work. So this, doing input validation, is a great way to use while loops. Remember that we have to do the or statement here, though. So with this, what we're saying is let's have a number line. We're going to have some sort of minimum value and a maximum value. So I'm just going to assign, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, let's say 10, and 0. So we want a valid value of between 1 and 5. These are all valid values. So we would translate this into programming logic as it's valid if input is greater than or equal to 1 and input is less than or equal to 5. But it's invalid if it's anywhere over here, anywhere less than 1 or anywhere over here, anywhere greater than 5. So we can check invalid if input is less than 1, or input is greater than 5. It might be easy to make a logical mistake here. You might think of putting an AND here. But that's not valid because you can't have a number be both less than 1 and greater than 5 at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. It's invalid if it's below the minimum or above the maximum. So just to make this clearer again, I'm going to comment this out. We're going to do a if valid and if invalid as two different checks. So if input is greater than or equal to 1, and input is less than or equal to 5, or again, I should be using the min and max variables, then we can output valid input. Down here, we can do the check for invalid input. If input is less than min, or input is greater than max, 
then it's invalid input. And we aren't going to go super in-depth in this right now, but these are actually logical opposites of each other. Oops. If I negate this entire thing here, and I say not this, that's going to be logically equivalent to this whole thing. So, what does that mean to you? Well, if this statement is false, and you have an else case in here, the else case is the same as this logic right here. So we can run this. If I put 6, it'll say invalid input. If I put 3, it'll say valid input. So that was a little bit with using the OR operator or how we can use the AND operator with our conditions with if statements and while loops. Let's then look at another use for while loops. Another thing I use while loops for a lot is to keep a program running until I decide to quit through a menu. So to keep the program running, first I create a Boolean and I say, are we done yet? No, we're not done. So Boolean done is false. Then I create a while loop. While we are not done with the program, we're going to do a program loop in here. And then down at this point, that means we're done with the program. So then in here, this could be uh, a main menu. So let's say one, add numbers. Two, subtract numbers. Three, quit. And then we can get the menu choice. And do all of the other program logic. Now eventually we'll learn how to kind of clean up the program more, but we're just working with if statements, variables, and loops right now. So I'm going to implement this example all inside of main. If menu choice is equal to 1, this is add numbers. Else if menu choice is equal to 2, this is subtract numbers. And we have else, we could do else if menu choice is 3, quit. And then I like to have an else case just to say this is invalid input. So in this case, I don't need to have that separate while loop checking the min and max. Stuff only happens if they choose one or two or three. And if they choose anything else, it's invalid input. And I'll just go back to the, the top of the loop and show the menu again. So let's show a plus b equals c. Uh, enter a, enter b, and then we'll calculate that. So I'll create int a, b, and c. I could declare them here or up here somewhere. We'll give the users input for a and their input for b. I like to kind of space these out so it's easier to read. Then we'll calculate c equals a plus b. So keep in mind when you're assigning a value to a variable by variable c, it goes on the left side of the equal sign. We get the equal sign and then we have the equation on the right hand side. Whereas in math, like you might see it this way a lot. We'll say c is equal to whatever c is. We can do a lot of the same thing here, except we're going to use subtraction. And then down here for quit, when they want to actually leave the program, we're not doing any math operations. We're going to set done to true. So when I run this program, I kind of eh, makes it hard to see that, but I want to at least kind of show the menu while we're going through. Let's say add numbers. I'll enter you know, a few numbers, and then it comes back to the main menu here. I can choose to do another option and I can choose to quit at the end. Now I will say this is kind of hard to read as program output, and I prefer everything to look a lot nicer. I will use a lot of white space to make things stand out more. So let's just do some quick formatting to see what it would look like to make a nicer looking main menu. So at the beginning of a menu, I tend to like to have kind of a splitter, like here's the beginning of your next step in the program. 
main menu, and you can kind of style it with ASCII art, I guess, in different ways. Sometimes I'll just draw a menu like this so that when I run it, you kind of have a nice heading up there. Uh, here at the menu choice, I just enter it and it's on this line. I like to have some sort of prompt so you know that the computer is waiting for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to display a little arrow sign, kind of like a little prompt. Now I know that I'm supposed to enter data here. Or I might even add some white space so that it's not right next to the menu. Then when I run add numbers, maybe I want that to have its own separate section or um, just be spaced out a little bit more. Oops, so. Let's say when we get to a different part of the program, we're going to do an extra end line. We're going to do another separator. And over here, let's say add. Down here, let's say subtract. And then this is just quit. So we'll run, main menu, add numbers, add A. B, C. And then you can kind of see where this part of the program ends and the next one starts. I would even add another end line in there to make it a little nicer, which I can do down here. Add numbers. And then you can see that here's the added numbers that happen, subtract numbers. And I can keep running the program and it's a little easier to see what's going on. Alright, so that's an example of using a while loop to have the program continue running. Let's do another type with a while loop, and then we'll try to do some do while loops. Though, I tend to use while loops much more than do while loops, but we'll get to that in a moment. Finally, I'm going to make something that tallies a running total. So we're going to keep the program running, and let's say the user needs to enter five numbers and then it's going to sum all of those numbers together. So we'll output running total. So how many times do we want the user input numbers? Well, five times. So uh, input counter is five, something that we're going to keep track of, while the input counter we can start with as greater than zero, input counter minus minus. I'm just going to run it like this real quick. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So in here, we will get the user's input and we'll add it to a running total. So we're going to need to input a number. But where do we add it to? Well, we need to make a variable to store the total as we're computing it, and it can't be inside the while loop because if we put it there, it would reset every time. If I entered int sum is zero, and then the added sum is sum plus the number, every time it'll come back up here and set sum back to zero, and it'll create a brand new variable each time. So this sum needs to be declared before the while loop starts, and then each time it will add some more data on. At the end, we'll say the total is the sum. And even inside of here, we could say running total. Well, we're not done calculating the sum. OK, so let's run this. It's just a simple program. So we'll need to enter several numbers and then it adds them all up for us. Okay, so let's think about do while loops for a minute. So with a do while loop, the difference here is it will always execute at least one time. And let's say we'll set minimum to 13 and maximum to 18. And that can be ages or something. We'll have the user enter in age. And we could say while input is less than min, or input is greater than max, have them enter the age again. 
So this will only get executed if it's invalid the first time. If it's okay, it'll completely skip over that. Now, where we could use a do while loop is to minimize the duplication of code here. This code, this code, those are the same. We know that we always want to get the input at least one time and then continue looping if they entered something invalid. So we could change this around. Instead of using this while loop, I'll just comment that out. We will write do while input is less than minimum and greater than maximum. So I'm going to get rid of this set right here where we're inputting. It will do this stuff, and then at the end, check the condition. Now with the do while loop, we need to have a semicolon at the end right here. We do not put a semicolon at the end of this or with an if statement or at the very end of a for loop. Only here at the end of this do while loop. But now we've removed some duplication because we are always going to ask the user to enter the age once, at least one time. And if they enter it right the first time, that's fine. If they enter something else, it'll keep asking for an age. Now this isn't always the best because it's going to give me the same prompt every time. And I would tend to want a prompt that gives me an error message and lets me know why it's not accepting the input. But it's okay for this example. Okay, now let's work with for loops for a little bit. For loops are particularly good at counting up, counting down, iterating through an amount of things. So you could use them in other ways as well. I would argue that it's less readable to go off the rails with your for loops. I would tend to just use them for counters. So let's say for int i is 0. I'm going to split these up for a moment. i is less than 10, i plus plus. And yes, you can split up your C++ statements on different lines for the most part. So this is going to be the initialization. Initialization. This is going to be the condition. And this is the update action. So in here, we'll output what i is each time. And I don't have to add any other code in here. This gets executed every time once it's done with the for loop iteration once. So it'll start here, it'll execute this code first, it'll check the condition, if the condition is true, it's going to execute this, and then it'll come back up and execute this. And it'll check the condition again, execute, execute this, condition, execute inside the code block, and then execute the update action. So if I run this, this is just going to count from 0 to 9. Or similarly, we had, let's say, int i is 0 here, while i is less than 10. We will output i, and then we have to make sure to increment i inside of the while loop. So we'll do output while loop, and for loop. So these do the same thing. But the positive thing about for loops here is I don't have to remember to, inside of the code block, increment i. It's a lot less error prone because it's just, you get kind of that muscle memory of, I'm writing a for loop, right? This part, and this part, and this part. So these both give us the same outputs, but I would argue that it's a lot nicer and cleaner to write it as a for loop. So I'm going to put this all in one line to look more like how you would normally see a for loop. Int i is 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. We could also go the opposite direction. Let's say i is 100, while i is greater than 0, and decrement it each time. Then that will count down from 100. Or you can put any kind of code here. You could say i is equal to i divided by 2, and then it will divide by 2 each time, and so on. So usually you'll just kind of have something simple like this, um, and that's fine. So what can we use it for? Well, let's go ahead and do that sum again. We'll say int sum is 0, 
and we're going to have them enter a value five times again. Well, i is five, i is, oops, sorry, i is zero, i is less than five, i plus plus. Now in this case, we don't really need i for anything, it's just there to be a counter variable. So we'll say enter number. We need to have some other number. And then we will add it to the sum. Running total is whatever the sum currently is at. And then at the end, we'll say the total is that sum. So the i variable isn't really being outputted. It's not being added to anything. It's just being used so the for loop iterates exactly five times. So let's say, there we go. So we got some numbers adding. So it's good. Well, when we get to arrays, there'll be some more stuff we can do with for loops, but I'm just going to show some different examples of how we can use it. You can also nest your loops, or you can put if statements inside the loops, or while loops inside of while loops, or, you know, you can, it's code. You can put any code that's valid inside of any code block, right? So I'm going to just start by making one for loop, and I'm going to say, let's just call it A and start at 1. While A is less than or equal to 12 and A++. plus plus. So I want it to go from 1 to 12. A and end the line. So it'll say 1 to 12. But I want to do another thing as well. We're going to say for int B is from 1 until 12. I'm going to have it output A and then times B. And I'm not going to calculate it right now. I just want to show you what this looks like. So it's going to iterate a lot more times. It's going to iterate 12 times here and 12 times here, so 144 total times. I don't want this to end the line right away. We're going to use a tab character. And I only want the line to end once it has finished with 1 to 12 for the B letter. And now it doesn't really fit all on the screen, but we basically have times tables here. 1 times 1, 1 times 2, so this is the B, the second one. B will iterate and go from 1 to 12, and then once the inside loop here, once this one has a false condition and B is 13, this loop will end. It'll do C out end line, so it'll come back down here. This will end. It'll increment A by 1, so A will go from 1 to 2 which we have right here. And then we'll start the B loop over again from the beginning. So we have 1 times 1 through 1 times 12, 2 times 1 through 2 times 12, and so on, until A has gone from 1 to 12 as well. So we can also put in equals and just put in A times B there and then show it. So it's not Maybe not going to fit super great, have to do some extra formatting, but you can uh, see like this tab didn't work out, so that looks weird. Let's maybe just put a space between these. Still not the most readable thing, but hopefully you get the idea. We have 1 times 1, 1 times 12 is 12, 8 times 12 is 96, and so on. And so this is with a nested for loop. We have one for loop that goes horizontally, and once it ends, it's going to go to the next line. So one loop is basically the vertical, and then combining them together, you have basically kind of a 2D shape. I can also illustrate this by let's just displaying a star for one iteration of the B loop. So then we have 12 stars this way and 12 stars this way. I know it's not symmetric here, but one character is taller than it is wide, so that's why this is a taller rectangle. And then I can adjust this. So let's come up with a width and a height. We can just ask a user for one, but I'm just going to type some in so we don't have to enter it every time. Let's say the width is 20, the height is 5. So again, 
this loop completes first. So, and the computer, it draws horizontally. Let me see if I can, it goes from the top left of the screen and goes one over at a time as it draws, kind of like a typewriter. And then once it's done, it'll return and come back here. So it goes, I'm trying, I have to like do this opposite on my camera, but it starts at the top left, it goes to the right, and then it goes down. Anyway, what I just said, you don't have to make sense of at this point. Uh, but as we go, I don't know, maybe here, let me do it this way. We'll output a counter and we'll add one to the counter each time. So you can see the order things are getting drawn in. So we have a width of 20. It starts at zero and goes to 19. So it displays 20 wide. Then it goes to the next line. And then it starts at that number. This is actually the 21st number because we started at zero. It goes another 20 wide and then goes down and so notice there's only five rows but there's 20 columns so we have a width and a height what else could we use a for loop for well let's say we have some sort of formula on position over time so if you remember from taking physics or something you could calculate oh this thing's position if it's falling due to gravity or something like that so let's say we have speed, maybe this is a car or something, and it can go 60 miles an hour, and we have time, let's just say this is per hour, or we can just say hour, that way might as well use nice variable names, we can have nice variable names in programming, even though we have to have one letter variable names in math. So we have a car that goes 60 miles per hour, let's say how many hours to drive, have the user enter an hour, and then do a loop. While int i is zero, i is less than hour, i plus plus. This will go from zero to however many hours they did. So for the, for hour i, distance traveled was, so we could put a formula here, or we could just add on to some other distance variable. So let's say int distance traveled is zero, it starts at zero. We'll add on to it every, every time by the speed, and we'll output it. So let's add one more end line just to make it nicer looking. How many hours to drive? We're going to drive 10 hours at 60 miles an hour. So for hour zero, we might change this up to be a little bit more intuitive because from a user's perspective, it's weird to start at zero. So instead, we'll go from one to the amount of hours. We'll go 10 hours. Hour one, we, moved, we traveled 60 miles. Hour two, we traveled 120 miles total and then so on and so forth, because we're going exactly 60 miles an hour. So we're going forward by that amount each time. Now, could I have calculated it with something like, oh, distance traveled, distance traveled is equal to, hmm, the speed times the amount of hours. Yeah, we could have done it that way, but let's say you are wanting to kind of view the progress over time, you could use that loop to kind of show where you're at in one hour, where you're at in two hours, where you're at in three hours, and so on. Okay, so hopefully those were some good examples on how to use while loops and for loops. If you have any questions, just let me know. I can do more examples as needed, but really um, just practice with it and then that will help you get better with it and figure out how they work better.